and welcome back to another episode of Access to Perspectives Conversations. Today we have Anna Farah in the room. Anna Farah, sorry. Um, Anna is working with the Royal Veterinary College in London, UK. And we actually met at a webinar by the Remo Course Action um, Initiative, which um, deals with researchers and mental health, which is a topic that you and I are both very passionate about and want to, or each of us are also working towards making life for ourselves and also other researchers easier um, and more, not only more durable, but actually enjoyable, um, despite the pressure points that we all know so well exist in the academic system. So very warm welcome, Anna. We are looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you so much for having me today. So to get us right into the yeah well, basically into the conversation, to how how about you share a little bit about your background? Um, you are originally Portuguese, or you are still Portuguese? I'm still you're Portuguese. originally from Portugal, yes. and um, and in the preparation for this recording, we we also said said it might be um, worthwhile for you to share some of your experiences that you had as a as a researcher coming from another country into England in your case, mm -hmm. and, um, how yeah how that played out for you. But first of all, yeah, what's your research background, your research interests that um, brought you into finally now the position that you're currently holding? Okay, uh, thank you. So yeah, I, I am trained in biology. I did uh, my undergraduate studies in biology, then did my master's in genetics and um, decided to pursue a PhD. Um, this was all in Portugal, my, my undergraduate studies and my master's studies. And then I decided to pursue a PhD in the Netherlands where I was studying um, developmental biology and oncology. So I was looking at um, how the same kinds of mechanisms that are involved, the cellular pathways that are involved during you know, cell fate decision-making during embryology are the same that are then later affected in cancer. Mm. Uh, then I, after this, I continued working in developmental biology, which was always a passion for me, but I decided to study neurobiology. So how the brain is formed uh, during embryology, specifically how the left and the right side of the brain are specified. And um, yeah, always using zebrafish as my animal model. But, um, you know, I, as I was um, doing my bench work, spe specifically during my postdoc, that I, I, I did my postdoc here in England, in, an, in, in, in London, um, I started noticing at some point that I was having much more fun doing a lot of the work that I was doing as a volunteer. Mm -hmm. I was um, doing a lot of work, outreach, outreach to children of underserved backgrounds, exposing them to science, granting them opportunities, work experience, which is something here in the UK, it's really important for access to top universities. Mm -hmm. um, and I was having far more fun doing that than doing my bench work. And there was a point that I thought this was telling me something that I needed to hear. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, in terms of my experiences um, being, you know, a foreigner in two different countries doing science, there was, yeah, there was a bit of a cultural shock when I, when I first uh, went to the Netherlands. Um, and I mean, there's several things that went into that cultural shock. I'm sure we can, if you want, we can delve yeah. in. It would be interesting to hear what it was for you because hearing the term cultural shock means different things for different people and sometimes it's not even easy to grasp what exactly it is. It's mm -hmm. probably a mi mix of things we miss from home and things that are on you and sometimes also maybe repelling or shocking that you find as a, I don't know, in a new country or just the, the feeling of not belonging as much. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. So for me, it was a combination of the things that you just mentioned. So I I went to the Netherlands, oh, I don't even remember which year now, 20, 20, uh, 2002, I first to do an Erasmus. So mm -hmm. I did an internship in a lab in Amsterdam. Um, and, you know, it was the first time that I was living away from Portugal, away from my family. I 
Um, I'm a fairly independent person and I was always very driven to go outside of my own country and explore other things. So there was not so much the component of missing home. I mean, of, co of course I was missing my family, but that I don't think that was where the shock was coming from. I think the thing that shocked me the most in, in that period was um, differences in communication, for sure. Mm -hmm. And um, some some differences in um, in the way people present themselves, how confident they are in 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 the academic space. So to give you some context, like Portugal tends to be quite hierarchical, especially in academia. You still you cannot really address. Well, you could not when I left Portugal, which was a while ago. But you could not really address your professor by their first name. It was professor so and so and that was not the case in the Netherlands so that kind of gave me a sense of familiarity when I got there that I thought it was going to be more relaxed but I still you know I was still carrying all of my cultural background in feeling that I had to be quite um, you know defer a lot to authority but what I wasn't really expecting is how that also kind of shaped my interaction with my supervisor at the time because I I was coming, I don't know, maybe this is, this can still say things about my own my own personal self, but I was coming almost thinking that I had to be super thankful for an opportunity. Mm -hmm. And I was overtly thankful for that opportunity. And on the other end, it didn't recognize recognize that that's where I was coming from. Um and I, it, 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 there were just a lot of weird misunderstandings between us, some language barriers, some cultural barriers. In, in 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 sense of you know some of the ideas that he had about Portuguese people that were not maybe the most flattering and sometimes he was expressing them <laughs> huh. yeah so one thing that I remember was that I made a comment and that was I was already well in I don't know a couple of months into my internship and it was a beautiful sunny day after a winter so I arrived in Amsterdam I think it was October and mm -hmm. I endured the long winter there uh and and in Portugal we just don't have we didn't have that cold winters right in comparison to the Netherlands so when finally spring came I said something to the effect one day during lunch break like oh it's such a beautiful day I wish we can you know I wish we could stay here outside in the sun and then he made a comment like oh, but uh, like, isn't it sunny in Portugal? How do you guys do? Oh, yeah, it's true. I forgot people don't work in Portugal. <laughs> oh. uh, or things like, you know, when I just arrived, um, he had little cultural training sensitivity because I had just arrived um, in a new country. I didn't know anyone in the institution. Like he was he showed me around the first day and then he was gone for a couple of days and I was literally left with a pile of papers this big by myself in a in an office that I didn't know anyone so I was coming in every week you know just sitting by myself in the office feeling miserable and reading this bunch of papers and also that was not the training that we had in Portugal uh, we were doing a lot of our studies from books not not um, academic papers so for me there was a learning curve there and, you know, when he came back, he just asked me about the papers and I had read some of them, but I think I think I didn't read all of them. And he made a comment without any uh, um, comedic <laughs> under, undertone uh, asking me if I had some reading disabilities. Wow. OK. <laughs> I wasn't very lucky, I have to say. Oh, it seems like either he's trying with the first one, he's trying to be funny, but then playing with prejudice and assumptions like that is just not cool. Yeah, and, and that was a little bit what I found about what comedy is like in the Netherlands a little bit, and that really didn't resonate with me, which tends to be always at the expense of other, because, the, I mean, he was not the only person that I met that did mm -hmm. that. Of course, there were a lot of absolutely lovely people, but some of the people that I work with, even afterwards in my PhD, were, were engaging in similar types of behavior as well, which uh, they were not very elegant, let's put it this way. Mm, sorry. But then that kind of affects a little bit the way that you see yourself because you internalize some of these messages, right? Mm. Um, yes. And and yeah, and then you have to essentially navigate in this system where you already feel 
a bit like an outsider and inadequate and um and yeah and you internalize a lot of the negative messages mm. I I was an Erasmus student around the same time like you I went to Sweden okay and so yeah but for me Sweden was more of a, for the longest time was a very positive experience because maybe also the cultures are similar German mm. and Swedish culture I mean still different but um, <clears throat> I was going that, but that, but but then also I have Swedish relatives, so I really wanted to dig into the culture and the language. Mm -hmm. Um, but then and then I remember we also had um ex no um researchers visiting researchers in the lab where I was working, mm -hmm. um, from Portugal, one of them, and they were the hardest working because they were also making use of the of having access to the equipment that the Swedes had as compared to where the university yeah. they were coming from. So they were the first in the lab in the morning and the last to leave. So yeah. I don't know. <laughs> because that's a little bit the culture in Portugal. It's like I think we we come from this way of thinking about well we used to. So again I haven't lived in Portugal for a very long time and I really only worked um, in Portugal for one year as an intern as well in a lab. But the culture was that we were like really early in the morning until really late in the evening. Um, and people that had access to, you know, more funds or research opportunities outside, they were really uh, like feeling super grateful that they, they had this access. And I think this comes a little bit from maybe an internalized image that we have, that we are, you know, we tended to be some of the poorest country, that one of the poorest countries in the European Union. And we had access for the longest time to fewer opportunities. There were fewer research institutes. Now we have a couple of really good mm. research institutes. And a lot of the science that is being done in Portugal is really um, is really world, world leading. But um, at the time, the, there were just fewer opportunities so we were really grateful I mean I was I'm going to speak for myself not my yeah. entire country I was really grateful yeah. to be given that opportunity without understanding at that time that I was also bringing something to the table and that placed me in a very vulnerable situation all right and now okay it's like I feel prompted to make a quick jump to your current position yeah. on what you're doing yes. with diversity equity and inclusion if you yeah. look at your own situation back then, and I think the feeling of gratitude comes naturally because with the opportunity and the experience of having a scarcity and then seeing what's possible mm -hmm. elsewhere. Um, yeah, I don't know if it's even possible to put that into perspective with your personal experience, but yeah, no, let's, let's continue <laughs> chronologically, maybe. Um, no, no. I just want to dig into that, like, or, or maybe just for a moment. Um, if you analyze your situation from your current position, mm -hmm. um, the also what you just said, like everybody's bringing something into the picture, like having a a student from another country in your lab, um, adds to diversity and mm -hmm. brings in the local experience and approaches methodological approaches and all of that of course an undergraduate student wouldn't be necessarily holistically aware of of what they bring to the table but i'm going with this yeah but I think... it's just a shame that people people feel that way and then the other thing is the sense of belonging and then being exposed and vulnerable did you have opportunities to exchange with other Erasmus students on such experiences and get some backing there? No, I I had. I mean, I luckily I I had um two really good friends of mine that were doing Erasmus at the same time as myself in um Delft. They were they were in Delft while I was in Amsterdam, so I always had that kind of point of contact but their experience were completely different from mine because they were two, they were in a much smaller um, institution. And I, I was kind of placed um, mm. in a lab, in an institution where at least they did, I did uh, there. So it was the University of Amsterdam in the department where I was, I wasn't really being exposed to other Erasmus students. I did have eventually uh, an, an American colleague 
And it was really interesting to bounce back some of our experiences. Mm -hmm. um, but to kind of tie in with what you were saying about what I do right now. So right now I am head of equality, diversity and inclusion. And I don't think it's by accident that I ended up doing the job mm -hmm. that I'm doing right now, because I think I want to save myself from 20 years ago <laughs> or from 15 okay, years the ago way for others coming after you oh. yeah because I think I had you know I had some unfortunate experiences with supervisors and it could have gone both ways and 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 this is something that I also like to reflect a lot in 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 the work that I do right now but I see I see academia as an extraordinarily creative environment that attracts a lot of really intelligent people but can be really, really toxic. And I think this toxicity is bred in from generation to generation to a point that it's like intergenerational trauma. Like we learn a way of doing things and we kind of perpetuate. That's what most people do. Or you have the opposite uh, effect, which I think was a little bit what happened to me, which was I always made the point in treating my students almost the opposite as what I was treated as a student because I was in many... And again, this comes later with some of, of, of the work that I do now around well-being, mental health in academia, but we have internalized this, this message of having to develop a thick culture, a thick skin culture in academia mm -hmm. um, that we cannot expose our vulnerabilities. And, and I think with that really comes a lot of the problems that we have. So I try through when I was a scientist and I was supervising, you know, master students, PhD students, I was always trying to make sure that I was offering them the support that I felt that I could have used at times. And eventually this is what I'm now working towards, which is at least creating the space for us to have these conversations in a way that really is conductive to change, hopefully. Hmm. Yeah, I think it's, it's, more often than we, many of us are aware of that our personal experiences are shaping our career trajectory. Mm -hmm. But in your case, it's, we are very much aware, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, especially because I had to make the decision at some point to at least leave my bench work. I didn't leave academia, but I left my career as a researcher. So yeah, mm -hmm. that there was a very conscious decision at that point, for sure. Yeah, but that's also, um, but also during your is it during your PhD that you took on volunteer um, positions? No. So during my PhD, I was in survival mode. <laughs> I didn't have time to do anything mm. except just trying to survive and, and pedal mm. to keep afloat. Um, but I was, I was, I did volunteering before when I was a student in Portugal and I was doing a lot of activism. I was doing volunteering with, with, with children in Portugal, um, and, and activism around education and access to fair, um, or fair access to education. Mm -hmm. And then I had to subside that in, in the Netherlands, just because I didn't have the time. I didn't really get involved in that space and I didn't have the, the, the network also to do that. Um, but that was something that I found really rewarding to explore again when I came to the, to England, uh, because here there's much more of a culture, at least that I was exposed to or aware of, uh, of volunteering. I think it's something that a lot of British people do at some point. Um, universities really also encourage their researchers to be actively engaged, for example, in outreach, because it's one of their strategic goals mm -hmm. is to um, increase, to widen access and participation to people from underrepresented backgrounds, to people that don't necessarily, you know, their parents haven't gone to university. So there's there's actually programs and offices in universities here to, to work mm -hmm. on that. So I was always very encouraged, if, if not even a little bit pushed towards it because then you know when you have to submit grants or you know, they ask for this kind of evidence that your lab is doing so yeah hmm. okay wow well, um okay so with the mental health um or hmm so how do you think diversity, equity, and inclusion are related to mental health issues or mental health, um, yeah, full stop, like to, to keep and maintain mental health? 
Okay, that's a bit of a broadly fetched question. Um, in what way do these two um, topics intertwine in your daily work? Um, well, first of all, there's a lot of research and evidence to show that minoritized communities do have poorer mental health outcomes mm. um, for a number of reasons. Um, specifically in the UK, it has to do, there's some cultural barriers to accessing um, support that we see that a lot in, in international students from different cultures that they, there might be um, kind of a block there for them to actively ask for help because it's not so culturally accepted as it isn't in here, but I think in, in different countries, the conversation is at different levels. And if this is not like openly accepted um, in 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 someone's culture, it just makes it more difficult for them to access that kind of support. Then there's you know all the levels of inequality that we can discuss about you know both domicile and and international people experiencing uh, in terms of having access to mental health support uh, or health support for that matter. Uh, all of those metrics, oh, there's a lot of studies that show that there are uh, a lot of inequities there. Um, in the context of academia, I, I go back to the point of um, the fact that we kind of accepted and normalized a certain level of toxicity in our environments. Um, it's kind of accepted to a degree that, again, there's the thick skin culture and there's that oftentimes can cross a line into actual bullying and harassment, but sometimes that line is a little bit subtle. So when you align that level of, um, of pressures with a number of microaggressions that minoritized groups tend to experience, and I include women in this groups, mm -hmm. right? Um, I think then you, you have the kind of asymmetric outcomes that you have for different groups. Mm -hmm. um, we see that in a lot of the studies that we do in universities, in a lot of the surveys that we do in universities with our staff and our students, that we have those indications of people ex having less of a good experience in their workplace. Um, and I think that's why, for me, there's not really a difference. For me, I think a lot of the work with relation to um, EDI, which is Equality, Diversity, and Inclusion, and well-being all stems from creating inclusive cultures and a culture of belongingness, as you were saying, the sense of you feeling like you belong in a space. If you're already entering a space like I was in the Netherlands, so again, closing closing down the loop, right? Thinking that you're already in deficit, then you already feel like you don't belong. And then that's already leading you to, you know, poorer um, outcomes. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's one of, one of the biggest problems we need to tackle. And then we can talk about how the structures in academia are also have been, you know, not intentionally, but somehow designed to perpetuate a certain status quo and a certain structure that has undertones of colonialism. So then you have um a lot of people that come from, and, and this in the context of the United Kingdom is particularly relevant, right? Because they were a massive empire. And I think having been that massive empire still influences a lot of the ways people here in the United Kingdom see themselves uh, um, or, or how the country operates. But there there is this systems that, again, they, they kind of... Um, are operating sometimes without knowing with this deficit model that people that come from outside need to compensate something, right? And, and the people that come from the outside sometimes have also kind of internalized, like I did that same deficit model. So then you already have someone feeling a little bit more vulnerable, already entering a space thinking they're imposters, but at the same time, they're entering a space that has not been designed for them. Therefore, they feel even more excluded if that makes sense. I think, well, it sure does. I'm just wondering if it's not a ubiquitous phenomenon because we have the same or very similar conversations in Germany. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you come into like 
another country and they have their national setup of running things and now looking at academia of course there's a lot of new things and there's something to catch up with as somebody who's coming in new mm -hmm. um so the question is like from a domestic researcher couldn't how can you breed a culture or or where you invite diversity as something first and primarily good and not seeing it as a deficiency for others to have especially in the research context you know what i mean yeah. because it's not for for research it's not so much catching up where there's a lot of catching up to do to learn about the administrative things to get a housing and, and to <laughs> learn your way and what learn a language whatever um just to to um establish your livelihood in in that foreign environment yeah maybe that's just also okay um well it's it's quite complex so i i think it's maybe it's by design as people move places and countries that there is a deficiency that's coming along but then the attitudes is something we can work with work against like having dominant attitudes for for the domestic parties and yeah okay so what what are the mitigation strategies that um that are being deployed to ease the situation for researchers who are coming so I think I think just to 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 tie in with some of the things yeah. that you pointed out and to answer to this question I think what a lot of universities are doing right now is to do a critical look at the way they conduct their teaching and research and to decolonize the way they do their teaching and research. Just an example, um, the type of Im imagery that people use when you have a program saying that you're going to be working um, in a in a country in Africa, and the image that you use to illustrate that is just a group of 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 poor black children with their t-shirts ripped off. Mm. You're kind of by the imagery that you're using, you're perpetuating this mm. image that a whole continent is a continent that needs to be saved, mm. right? Uh, so that's one at it, one thing that you can work on is to really critically look at the way you are constructing your curriculum. If you're giving examples that are celebratory of the contributions of people that are just not based in Europe or in the United or, or in the US, um, but it's 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 super difficult because this is it goes much deeper than just the one university, but. Yeah. A lot of universities are doing individually this work now to kind of really review the ways they're teaching and the ways they're communicating even. Um, for example, even in terms of um, access to mental health support for students, this is another thing that universities are looking into, which is what are the resources that are that are we are offering are and are we culturally sensitive and educated to really provide support to people from different backgrounds? Um, do we have a diverse body of staff providing these services? Are we celebrating role models that don't look just like the typical white male professor? Mm -hmm. This was an exercise that I used to do which so I was part of of this um uh, of this um nonprofit organization called Native Scientists. and that was an organization created. I think it was in 2014, if I'm not mistaken, um, but it, it it was created here in London by two Portuguese scientists because they just realized that um, they were interacting with the with with the Portuguese community here and and saw that the kids that were growing here, they had um, they were coming from lower social social economical backgrounds and oftentimes they had um, slightly worse outcomes than. Uh, British kids mm. and one of the things that they thought that they could do to tackle this is to expose them to role models that would speak their heritage language and to show them that you know another path was possible and that has to do a lot with the history of Portugal like we 
we lived through a dictatorship until 1974. There were uh, a lot of people that have immigrated as a result of that. And even in, through, you know, 70s and 80s, it was a poor country. So a lot of people were um, economic migrants. And we have a big population of people that have migrated mostly from, from some islands, Madeira, um, that have come, came here in the 70s, the 60s and 70s. And that, you know, they kind of, um, they a lot of this community has worked uh, mostly in hospitality. Oftentimes they don't interact too much with the local the the local culture. Many people I've I've talked with people that didn't even really know very well how to speak English. Oftentimes they also come from a background that they maybe they just about knew how to read or write, right? Like in Portugal in the 70s, like a big percentage of the population was illiterate. Mm. Um so so that program, I mean, this didn't happen to myself, but it happened to a colleague of mine that a friend of mine that when, when she was doing we would go to schools essentially and like talk with kids in Portuguese about science and like show do a little experiment with them so they could also experience themselves. And it was one child that uh, turned to a friend of mine and said, I never knew that a Portuguese person could be a scientist. Hi. OK. And this stays with you, right? Um, so uh, oftentimes there's also this link between, you know, being from a deprived, socially deprived backgrounds and then not also not seeing yourself or someone that looks like you or speaks your language or has your customs mm -hmm. represented. And one of the things that I used to do was a little bit of a myth busting where I was giving examples of three scientists, starting with the letter A, that were neither men nor <laughs> nor white mm. uh, to children. And normally they 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 really like that kind of exercise. Because oftentimes, you know, it's about the way you tell a story and, mm. and, and we are always forgetting some heroes that don't look like the, mm. the normal, normal. Don't look or speak and write. So I would like to come back to a comment that you mentioned uh, mm. at the introduction part of this podcast. Um, right. where, you, where, where you briefly touched upon the language barrier that you experienced um, as you came to the Netherlands or mm -hmm. um, or now I, I presume it was English maybe also a little bit of Dutch and then not being able to express yourself as a native speaker would do mm -hmm. and struggling with the words in a rebuttal of, of, of the, yeah, the ones that you've um, exemplified um, I've recently, or earlier this year, I reviewed a research article that looked into the cost of English as a second language, and they measure, they looked at different countries and, and um, English speakers, second, third language speakers, and first, and what? Well, what we all non-native English speakers know so well from our personal experience is also measurable that many researchers deprive themselves of career opportunities because of the language barrier. Yeah. And that's really heartening to read in a, in a paper. Um, and there was, and maybe it was the paper that you reviewed, but there was a paper just published very, very recently about exactly that, like the, the costs of yeah, being... No, it was, yeah that was just published like a week ago or something there you go yeah yeah, yeah. Very interesting paper. um so how does language come into your work like is this part of the conversations that you're dealing with um when it comes to diversity inclusion because personally i'm pushing a lot for multilingualism in academia or this is yeah. basically one of my hard subjects as as a trainer, um, and then the Helsinki Initiative, the importance of being able to express your work and what you're learning on the subject, on the research sub um, or objects uh, in your own language, like with the words and the, to be able to describe properly what you're observing. I think that's a must have in your own language. But then also, as I did already my undergrads in, in Sweden, in English for the most part, mm -hmm. I quickly lost German as a scientific language, mm -hmm. so even though some, some also coming from biology and the classical biological topics still operate very much in German, like zoology, ecology, and those things. Mm -hmm. uh, not so much molecular biology, but 
Um, but I wouldn't today. I wouldn't be able to describe anything research related in German. Or I I struggle a lot also mm -hmm. with all the sites work I'm doing. Um, yeah. Any thoughts on that from your where where you at? Uh, I I can tell personal thoughts on that, and I can tell a little bit what um people working in 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 the space of of cultural awareness um are talking about. But personally, yes. So when I when I started doing this this work with native scientists, there were two barriers to speaking with kids. The first one was translating my science to Portuguese. That as as you just mentioned, I had completely lost it after doing you know my PhD in the Netherlands. But the mm -hmm. second barrier was translating your science to five year old children, <laughs> which mm -hmm. would be a barrier in any language. Um, so actually, in terms of studies, there has been studies that show that bilingual children can take a little bit longer to to really start picking up things in school in in early ages eventually once they do there's absolutely no difference in terms of outcomes except there are systems like in here where from relatively early age onwards you're kind of labeled into top performer versus lower performer and then even the way the expectations that the school have around you already shape your outcomes which is something that personally growing up in Portugal we didn't have that we didn't have at least um, systematically like it was not part I mean you always had kids that were performing a little bit better, kids that were not performing so well, but we were all part, part of the same classroom. We all had to teach the same curriculum. It kind of, I think, in my view, it forced maybe the kids that were performing a little bit better to be also cognizant that, you know, the world was made of different people. And at the same time, I think exposing the children that were not performing so well to others that could explain or help them was also beneficial. Mm -hmm. That's my mm -hmm. experience, my the uh, um, opinion. I don't have any data to substantiate that as a fact. But in terms of language um, and culture, how culture associates with, it with language, actually, there's a lot of very interesting linguistic studies that look on the ways you express yourself in your different languages. And one example that it's given, it's, for example, the way you say something in uh, English versus Spanish, like you have a situation where a vase has been found to be broken and then you have two witnesses, right? You have an English speaking witness and a, a Spanish speaking witness. And mm -hmm. the way you would say in English is like Tom broke the vase, whereas in Spanish is the vase has been broken. Right. And and almost the implications that drop drop from this. And this was a study that was done in the context of how people that have different native language can um, give testimony and how much credence we give to the testimony that they give. The way that even grammatically the, the, the sentences are structured, the English sentence immediately indicates there is a culprit, whereas the Spanish sentence or the way the Spanish speaker has said does not indicate that. Mm -hmm. So this already you can see how it can even um, slightly change your perception of things, right? Another example that has been given, and I, I don't remember which language it was now, but how you describe some objects. And if you, in some language, um, some languages, objects are gendered, like in Portuguese, um, I think in German as well, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, the same object, I don't remember now which language, but like the moon in some languages is feminine, in some languages is masculine. And depending on how you, depending on the gender that you attribute to this, well, to this uh, object, right, celestial object. Uh, so the words that you use, then the adjectives that you use to describe are different, or like the bridge, for example, a bridge that it's feminine or masculine. If it's feminine, you talk about how elegant and beautiful the bridge is. And if it's masculine, you talk about how strong it is. Mm -hmm. But one thing that I just did a training recently that was very interesting, which was on cultural intelligence. And one of the things that the trainer was going about was the fact that depending on your cultural background, you have different ways even of thinking about yourself and the way you communicate. And there's like cultures that are collectivist, like in Portugal, we say a lot, we, it's mm -hmm. like family driven, we, we are the group, we are the tribe. And they they would just suppose this, for example, against uh, Nordic cultures that tend to be more individualist, individualistic. And this is not to pass judgments or anything, but it's just to uh, express how language affects things. Mm -hmm. uh, so in Portugal, we would say much more. And I found that 
cultural language barrier myself. Like I felt very uncomfortable saying I, I have done this. Or I, you know, taking credit just for myself was really difficult and was something that I had to learn, especially here to nail jobs and job interviews. I knew that I had to say I, whereas if you're from a different culture and in, 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 it comes out more naturally, right? And I remember in that same training, there were people there that were saying that there was almost a light bulb moment, like native English speak speakers that were a light bulb moment where they were thinking back of their job interviews thinking like, oh, someone said we, and we didn't really think that they were, because we are trained to think when you're doing conducting a job interview, that if someone says we instead of I, it means that they actually haven't done the work. Or another example, like looking the person in the eyes, like mm -hmm. there's some cultures in Asia that it's very disrespectful to look especially a superior in the eyes, whereas um, it's more normal in here to do that or it's not dis not seen as disrespectful. So all of these differences Actually, in the actual the language or even the way that you communicate uh, can affect. And and then just to, to finish this loop, I, I did hear one of your other podcasts where you were talking about, I don't remember which, which episode it was anymore, but there was something about training scientists in academic writing. And immediately my EDI brain was, what, what is academic writing? Who defines who academic writing looks like? And it's it's English, right? And it's a way that... I wouldn't uh, say it's English by default, but in, in bioscience, unfortunately, it looks as if it's become that way. But yeah, I mean, it's a, it's an assumption, depending on your the context you're coming from, then yeah, by default, it would be English in many cases. No, but for for example, academic writing, when I was a student in Portugal, the, the way we grammatically construct our phrases tends to be a little bit longer. And I, I saw that to be the case later on in life with students from France, students from Spain, mm -hmm. whereas here it's much more succinct. And mm -hmm. I think it's, it, of course, it's good to be succinct, but I wonder if that's a difference between the grammatic structure of the language or if it's something that we collectively have decided that was the best way to communicate science. I don't know. It's just, a, you know, I'm just living here as a thought provoking no. comment. Uh, for that, I, like my stand on this as a trainer and scientific or academic or whatever writing is that it's a myth, basically, what, whichever is better, because mm. it really depends on the sentence structure, which you can also achieve with punctuation other than the full stop. Yeah. Um, and it just matters to take the reader along through a line of thought or a train of yeah. thought. And then a sentence can be as long as one page, like bridge or yeah, bridging several lines of text. Um, but if the sentence structure has a logic, then that doesn't harm the readability, really. And then yeah. some trainers would argue or our researchers know it have, has to be concise and succinct in order to be comprehensible, but that's not true. Mm. I mean, it's, it's more the structure and the order of and placements of subject, object, verbs, whatnot. So you need to have a a decent understanding of of the language in order to express yourself, so so that others can follow your your thoughts. Yeah. and that's now difficult for non-native <laughs> speakers to achieve. Obviously. Yeah, yeah. No, but there's definitely that. There's that element of additional texting to non-speakers, right? Non-native speakers. Mm -hmm. um, and I have a friend of mine that she she went to live in Brazil a couple of years ago to study ecology and also for, for family reasons. She's Portuguese, but um, she has family there. And when she got there, she just became exposed to all this literature published in Portuguese that she thought it was immensely rich and at a quality that could easily be published internationally but it was being published in Portuguese, right? And it can be for a number of reasons, it can be economical barriers to publishing internationally, but it can also be language barriers. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I wonder how much are we losing, but I also, I see the value of having, you know, uh, a common language, a common language to, to talk in science because it does remove mm -hmm. um, obstacles and facilitates easier communication if we all kind of agree okay this is the language that we'll be speaking with and um now Does that really i would have agreed with you before reviewing that article by looking at all the costs and the losses along the way yeah. 
I don't think it brings a lot of benefits having one, one presumably one lingua franca. Also, there's several as we speak, because Portuguese, Brazil, yeah. and Portuguese, Spanish, French, yeah. even Chinese has their own yeah. Russian. And and just to, to like the the scholarly databases that most researchers use are highly proprietary. So yeah. they only look at or mostly look at English content yeah. and ignore the rest. And that's probably more, I don't know. And then also the English speaking countries are the ones that are most prolific in publishing. But is it even, I mean, I, I don't want to argue that it's of low quality, but the level of detail is not like we can't make sense of anymore as a global society <laughs> because who's reading all these articles first of all second yeah we're ignoring all the research that's being published in an in institutional repository that are not being digitally harvested and then other languages which yeah the rest yeah the, again yeah. the system is pushing for this quantity right because that's what you're being i mean you're being evaluated on on the impact in principle that your publication has but also the number of papers that you're publishing depending on the sector you are at yeah. right in some sectors like mind developmental biology we have to do really complex experiments that would take years so then it's a little bit more acceptable that you're not copying out the paper every year um as a phd or as a postdoc then as a pi you're kind of expected to be doing that but if you're doing other types of studies that can happen at a faster pace, then you really see insane numbers of publications. And then I agree with you. Like, it at the same time, it is important that this knowledge is out there. And I would even argue that we're not publishing enough because we're not publishing, for example, negative results, right? So that there's that kind of black hole of things that probably we're wasting enormous amounts of resources because yeah. yeah. we don't know what has been done before and has failed or things that sometimes don't align completely with the the easier messages because also like you know publishers don't like things that ruffle too many feathers i mean yeah i understand like you know really really things that are out there they have to be substantiated by a big body of evidence but but still sometimes it's also a little bit limiting in the way that the way you tell your story that if it doesn't if it's not simple enough, it can also be put aside and then it's, you know, it's knowledge that it's not known that you maybe there was an explanation a few years down the line. And if you had other, you know, access to other data and technology to access that. But again, putting my EDI hat on <laughs> when you're talking about um, English uh, countries being more prolific, they're also the ones that have more access to funds, significant funds. Oh, yeah. Sure. so <laughs> there is yeah. like a correlation there so you're you're kind of always perpetuating this same loop and I attended a meeting a couple like a year ago or two years ago that was precisely about the the need for diversity in science uh with a panel that almost had no diversity at all but that's a different matter altogether uh and and one of the things that was really like rubbing me the wrong way was like people always say yes diversity but excellence you know like as if it was two opposing terms and I, my question to them at the time and I still ask this question like who is defining what excellence looks like because then we can have a lot of conversations right like who are the people granting um funds for research are I think we are at this stage that we're just perpetuating more of the same so the people that are trained in one specific way of thinking are the ones that get elevated in, in the system, right? Get to the top of the echelons in the system. And then they can only really accept their perspective and therefore will fund most likely projects that look like something that they themselves would do. Mm -hmm. And how do we insert diversity in here? Ah, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I have some ideas, but yeah, it, I think it's a very interesting conversation that the sector needs to have. Absolutely. I'd like to hear your ideas. And just briefly before I want to regarding the assessment and yes it has been for too long um a measure of uh the numbers of of journal articles in particular journals of a particular factor impact factor that shouldn't really matter because it's not designed for that purpose mm -hmm. <laughs> um 
But then we have initiatives like as of Dora, Guara, Scope to to come up with other measures that are more quality based. But then I think that yeah is is ongoing, and I unfortunately we're still in the middle of it, or fortunately so. So we can shape it. When yeah. like it's also something that I tend to uh, um mention like when people say oh the system is broken and things are so bad, but we are in charge now. We can change it. So <laughs> so we are the system. So let's fix the cracks. And it's not completely broken, I wouldn't think. But there is a lot of new opportunities in the digital era. How we can and here's a like um to to give the mic back to you. So. Where do you see the lowest hanging fruit and opportunities, lowest hanging fruits for opportunities to provide for inclusion and a better, more equitable approach in like whichever um, whichever um, issue you want to pick because there's so many <laughs> that we <There's> so many. <laughs> Maybe I can give you examples of things that have been uh, happening in the UK that have had tangible outcomes, um, albeit imperfectly, but nevertheless. So um, we have a, a UK-based UK charity called Advance HE, Advance Higher Education. It's a non-for-profit non organization. It's also um, like a body professional membership scheme that really tries to promote excellence in higher education. And they want to kind of benchmark and give training around what teaching excellence and research excellence look like. One of the exercises they have been doing for, I don't want to say the number because I'm going to say it wrong, I think it's 15 years, but certainly more than 10 years, is a program for gender equity. Mm -hmm. That it's embedded, that it's basically data-driven uh, efforts towards gender equity, and it's called Athena Swan. A uh, swan comes from scientific women in academia network. So it started by being almost like a grassroots initiative of women that came together and said like, yeah, right, it's not working for us. I mean, you have a lot of disciplines, especially in STEM, it started with women in STEM. Um, you have disciplines where when you enter the career pipeline as a student, you have like above 60 to 70 percent of representation of women. And as we progress in the career, then you see a massive drop. Mm -hmm. And there's this very well known, like we call it like Caesar graphics, where you have the point from which like you have lower representation of women than men. And when you get to full professorship, you have 25 percent representation of women. When you look at intersectionality, this looks even more shocking, right? Uh, so right now in the UK, we have something like 12,000 white male professors, around four to 5,000 white female professors and 45 black female professors. Mm -hmm. This is just, and it's definitely not representative of the, the, the demographics. Mm -hmm. um, what Advance HE and the Tina's one particularly did was they created this framework where departments and institutions could apply for an accreditation to demonstrate their commitment towards gender equity in academia. And essentially, it's it's very much like, I see it almost like a grant application process because you have to submit data from your institution with regards to staff and students. Um, they ask for a number of different things to be looked at, the you know, numbers of recruitment, numbers of people that apply for promotions in the interval of time, normally between three to five years, um, and to look critically to see where the pain points might be. Mm -hmm. And you do this, you know, throughout different aspects of the life cycle of, of a researcher. Now, more broadly, they also extended that to people working in administrative support as well and the life cycle of a student, and you try to find the points of attrition. So what, what do I mean by attrition? If you have jobs that you have a certain percentage of women applying to, but consistently you have much fewer women than men, then, or uh, in lower pr proportion, women are offered less chances to be called for an interview, and then the same for job, um, job offers, then you can admit one of, and this consistently happens, you know, in three, in the three-year interval that you look at or the five-year interval that you look at are the same for promotions, right? You have a certain number of women applying for promotions and then you don't have like an equivalent representation of the women that actually get the promotion. You can either admit that these women collectively are less capable and less uh, qualified than men mm -hmm. or 
you admit that there's a bias in the system. I mean, mm -hmm. these are the only two options, in my opinion. So when you identify those pain points, you draw an action plan saying what you're going to do to tackle these pain points. And depending on how long you've been in, in this journey of kind of self-analysis, um, you can apply for certain levels of awards. So you have the bronze level, which is the first steps that you take into your gender equity journey that you just did this analysis for the first time, you identify the pain points and you draw an action plan. The second level is silver, where you have already previ a previous bronze award. And in the meantime, you have worked on your action plan and you have evidence of impact of the actions that you've uh, made. And an example of what impact looks like, um, you notice that you had a lower success rate for promotions for women. So what kind of actions can you suggest that you will implement? You can implement a mentoring scheme to support women in uh, applying for fellowships. You can do a, a promotion uh, workshop. You can make sure that your promotion criteria are clear, clearly um, explicitly published in your website because in a lot of universities, this is not the case. And then you see, okay, I implemented this in 2017. And then I looked at my numbers in 2018, 2019, 2020, and oh, it's starting to pick up. So that's what they call impact. If you do that, you have a silver award. And if you, on top of this, you still have, you, you do all of this and you're still having like a, a beaconing uh, role in, in the sector, then you have a gold award. There's very few institutions in the UK that have gold award institutions or departments because this can be done at the university level but also departments in the university there's i think six gold awards in total in the united kingdom um and this has been something that shift really shift the balance to having a higher number of women in professoriat um it's imperfect because it benefited mostly white women because there was not an intersect intersectional lens uh, included in this analysis for the longest time and now since a few years back, I think 2018, 2019, this has been now asked that at least institutions with bigger enough, big enough numbers of people do that kind of analysis. The same approach has been now applied to race equality as well. So they have the race equality charter where the logic is a little bit the same, but we're still in very early ages of that uh, to really be seeing benefits. But I think what this exemplifies is that, you know, Inequalities happen for a number of reasons. A lot of them have to do with personal bias. There's a lot of research that shows that doing unbiased training does not work because you're just putting the onus on the individual to undo in 30 minute or three hour session what they've learned their whole life. So you really have to think about processes to keep yourself as an institution honest and review your data to critically analyze if you're doing a good job and if you have an equitable outcome, yes or no. And if not, what are the things that need to be happening? Also programs like this um, require institutional accountability. And in the past, uh, having a certain level of uh, Athena Swan Award was linked to having access to funds, governmental funds in the UK. Mm -hmm. And that was really positive. Unfortunately, during COVID, uh, our government decided that this was an undue burden on institutions and they lifted that requirement and they have not reinstated since. Hmm. Um, but here's an example. I think it's a pragmatic example. Maybe I'm a bit biased because I'm a scientist and I like data. So this is part of the work <laughs> that I do. I do data audits. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, I really think there's value in that because it really, you know, it's a language that senior leadership understands, mm. right? The language of data. And it really forces institutions to really think like how they're gonna tackle. And I should just mention that you need to reapply for awards every five years. So you have the award for a certain number of years and then you reapply. So even though we don't have this requirement to having access to funds at the moment, um, it is still often used as an example for other funding bodies as. What, are, what is your institutional commitment towards EDI? So I think still think it's going to be valuable for years to come uh, mm -hmm. in terms of demonstrating this level of commitment. And there's also reputational gains because then if an institution, I've seen this firsthand, like once they have a certain level of award, they don't want to go back. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so in my opinion, this is something that works. It's like a, a, a mechanism that it's tied to a little external carrot. I'm very cynical about how the world works. So there's this little external carrot, but at the same time, it really forces um, this EDI lens to be involved in the processes rather than expecting that people do the right thing just because. Uh, yeah, I, okay, sounds, sounds, sounds compelling. I, I still want to understand what still bothers me is that why is there such a discrepancy between wanting to do the right thing and doing something for the quota? And aren't there always people who think, oh, just doing this to fulfill a quota? And yes, to get the golden or so, whatever silver standard. But then is it fair? Then my question. Um, you know what I mean? Despite, uh, so where is the narrative of what benefits to the research process and to a healthy institution? Mm -hmm. Is this part of the narrative that diversity actually matters because it improves any process, also in companies and also in academia? Because so you have those different viewpoints now in one place, and there's 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 actual data on that as well. So is this part yeah. of the conversation? So it's part of the narratives, yes, but I think in a lot of institutions that narrative is more performative than have, mm -hmm. having actually real grasp. Don't forget that the people that are sitting in leadership positions, they have risen to that position having excelled under a certain status quo. And what you're telling oftentimes when you say, oh, there's you know inequalities in the system that are hindering the progress of a certain group of people that more than others I think a lot of people in senior leadership positions may be afraid that this is telling them that they they had it easy or it takes away their their own merit yeah. so I, I see oftentimes irrespective yeah. of being yeah. men or, or women that there is that kind of resistance towards this rhetoric and a lot of people think these exercises can be um you know just um just a ticking box exercise without real grasp. But I have seen also places where you have come from a place of some cynicism to a place where then your reputation as an institution starts changing because you start, start seeing by your peers as you know being leading in these areas. And all of a sudden, even people that may be a little bit cynical will get on board with it. So there was one, in, one of the, the departments that it, holds a gold award for many years, the Natina Swan Gold Award for many years. One of the things that has changed for them was the way the narrative was being given, because I think oftentimes the way EDI is being presented, it, it makes people a little bit resistant if they are part of the groups that, it, that enjoy more privilege. And my way of seeing EDI and doing EDI is that it's about fairness and transparency. Mm. And in that scenario, everyone benefits. And in, in the case of this department in particular, they say that one thing that really was helpful to shift the attitudes was to have a motto and their motto is simply good practice. Mm. And all of a sudden, when they framed it in that way, everyone was on board because there's an inherent sense of meritocracy and fairness that I think a lot of people have, right? And, yeah. and a lot it resonates with a lot of people and um, when you appeal to that, and when you also show even, you know, to the gatekeepers that they themselves are also not, they could be doing better with, you know, fairer outcomes and fairer access to information and, and a, a much more healthy environment, then I think people are on board. But now we can link it to the well-being, right? Because I think a lot of the problems that help happen with the culture that we have in academia is that I think suffering is seen as a badge of honor and going through really hard times is seen as something that you absolutely have to go through in, in, in academia. And actually there's there's been a number of studies showing that and one of our biggest funding bodies here in the UK, the Wellcome Trust has run um, their, their internal uh, research that they, they produced a report in 2020 called Reimagine Science and it was about research culture. And they interviewed over 4,000 researchers, uh, most based in the UK, but also in other countries. And some of the conclusions that they reached were a little bit dire. 
One of them was that most often abuse was being perpetrated by the person's own supervisors. Uh, but there was also this, again, narrative. There was a study in 2021 that was looking at outcomes, I think was for, for postdocs, where they were also picking on the same thing, on this narrative of, you know, this badge of honor of working so hard. So then people see this as a rite of passage, that you have to go through this in order to be successful. So therefore, they don't necessarily think that something needs to be changed, or they don't see this positive belonging I don't know. It's just I, I've been talking with a lot of people in this space, especially when I was working on, on well-being, that people still think this is a fluff piece until more recently when you start having a bit more evident the epidemia of burnout in academia and people like universities are having trouble recruiting postdocs. Yeah, also, I mean, this comes from the, from the phrase like pressure makes diamonds, but working oh. hard doesn't mean that you have to suffer. Like you can still be working hard and make room for recreational phases in order to be being able to perform high throughput, high level for for long, like throughout a career, really. You know, best case scenario in that. Yeah. Anyway, so yeah. You know, in my PhD, my PhD supervisor at a certain point, because I was living, I did my PhD in Utrecht, in the Netherlands. And for a little while, I moved to Rotterdam because uh, my then boyfriend, now husband, was living there. And I wanted to experience a different city. And we're talking about a train ride of 45 minutes. I mean, my commute in London is longer than that. Mm -hmm. um, so, I, I mean, I did that. And he called me to his office to have a conversation about my personal uh, decision of moving to a different city when I didn't really see that that was any of his business, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and then he started really making comments saying, I don't see you working on weekends anymore. And like that, if that was the norm or expected, <laughs> I have to say that I did push back to that rhetoric. And I did say, well, well, a lot of my Dutch colleagues are not working here on the weekends. Oh, but that's different. They have a family. I'm like, excuse me. So there is... <laughs> <laughs> there is, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, there is this idea, and I remember also when I was doing my my internship in Portugal that our supervisor was also very. He was saying that he expected us not to give a hundred percent, but to give a hundred and twenty percent. We were expected to be there every day, including weekends, um, and at least when I was growing up in science <laughs> as a researcher well-being and mental health was not factored in at all mm. at all and now I'm happy to talk with you know the new PhD students this is very much hammered into them they already know that they need to have a good work-life balance um, and maybe it was always better in the UK compared to Portugal or the Netherlands I don't know but I think um, it's also quite recent but maybe longer than in other countries yeah. Yeah, I think in, in Germany it's in 2016 only or mm. well, before then we, we had some working groups in the PhD in the Max Planck Society. Um, no, but you have also the Remo initiative right now, which I think it's brilliant because it's really giving space for people to have these conversations. But for example, one of the initiatives that I drove already in my role as EDI um, practitioner I held, um, I designed and helped launch a conference, a conference, no, sorry, um, a webinar on mental health in academia. And we were very, um, very deliberate in our choices, namely the person that we wanted to lead that initiative. So we made sure we look, looked at our metrics that were indicating actually that our male PhD students were faring worse in terms of mental health outcomes. Um, so we wanted to have a male role model also because I don't want, again, that uh, the, the conversations around mental health, well-being or EDI are exclusively held by minoritized groups. So I, 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 I asked a, a male, a white male professor that was really well liked and loved in the institution that I was sure that they didn't have any skeletons, you know, that he was, he himself was abusing people in his lab. I made sure that he had like a good reputation with his students. So he, he delivered this session that was showing some of, you know, some of the findings of more recent uh, studies and literature, and then to have to open up this conversation. 
and it was super well attended. And he told me afterwards that it, the, the attendance to this session was bigger than any attendance for any of his <laughs> sessions. And people were just on the call, like we went over our time and you could see that if we decided to go another hour, people would have stayed there because I think everyone is desperate to having space to have these conversations. And this is, at least in the UK, it's, it has been happening in the past years in a way that it's been really significant. Um, you know, a lot of people have their own internal struggles and demons and you don't even know. I, I organized um, an event in 2019 that was about careers beyond academia. And it was really, so this was pre-COVID times, right? So it was attended in person, but it was really super well attended. More than 200 people attended on the day. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of colleagues, and I did this with a friend of mine and we did it as volunteers, so in our extra time, we organized this event and a lot of people came to speak either with me or her after the conference, many in tears, thanking us for opening up even the conversation about other career pathways being possible. And and because um, that's a taboo subject sometimes in academia, right? Like you think that this is your only way. And, and I even had people confessing that they had um, had in the past suicidal ideations. Mm -hmm. And that's where I think that was a big turn turn turning moment for me to realize that you know i wanted to work in the area that i work right now with you know well-being mental health and really being very vocal about a lot of the challenges that that we all experience in academia yeah um wow there's a lot to digest <laughs> um i want to briefly to, to, to touch on the notion of privilege that you talked about um Mm, and yeah, and I think it's a good time to mention the academic wheel of privilege, which was yes. developed also by Ford. And were, were you also part of the team? Or were you seen? No, I was not. No, I, but I know the work, yeah. So I think what you also mentioned, and I think the fear is, I don't want to say valid, but it's understandable for privileged people in superior positions to fear that they are being unvalidated by mm -hmm. the conversation about diversity, equity, and inclusion um, because of the privilege they've, they've, ex they've had that brought them into the positions that they now hold. But looking at the academic view of privilege really um, kind of uh, like what, what I found, like everybody's privileged to some degree. Like yeah. there's nobody who's totally unprivileged. Like, I mean, then probably it might be if you have a small enough group and there's a least privilege, but still privilege. <laughs> um, or if you look at, you know, the whole global society, then there is the one. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And then there's, of course, extreme, uh, disproportional under, yeah. Anyways, but um, I think what the academic way of privilege nicely shows in a scholarly context is the the patterns the different aspects what leads to privilege to raise awareness but also to um call for humbleness is that a word <laughs> mm -hmm. um and then and privilege comes with responsibility to to use the privilege to to shape edi basically so it's an opportunity so instead of shouting and blaming those who are and or basically scapegoating them or what's the word um it's like how and i think that's also what's happening like if we invite everyone on the journey to use each our privilege um to shape a system that we want to see um emerging from where we are today. Um, and that gives everyone some power position, for lack of better words, to mm -hmm. have their stake in the game of yeah, of creating an equitable or more equitable towards equality and justice in the academic system. And then also again, like keeping high in the conversation the benefits that come with um with diversity and inclusiveness mm -hmm. in the workplace and any organization in the research um, 
endeavor as a whole. I think that's so yeah. <clears throat> hmm. It's a I think it's a continuous process and it's it's like a never ending story. But <laughs> it's I mean not to to sound to what's the word now? I don't want to sound negative, but I think it's a constant challenge that we as humans are exposed to solve. Because there, there will never be justice. There's there's not such a thing like democracy. It needs to be fought and, and worked for every day. Oh, sure. So, but if everybody yeah. knows their place and doesn't feel they're being minoritized for whatever reason, to then build resistance in the process. Yeah, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> I don't know if that makes for a conclu concluding remark. But yeah, I think so. And I think what you're talking about is, is two things. It's personal responsibility that needs to be borne by those who have a, a unique platform, right? If 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 you if you are in a position of leadership or if you are holding, you know, a specific stage in society, it comes with added responsibility. Yes, you're being like, I don't know, a mm. Nobel Prize winner, right? Like they're being celebrated for their achievements, but with great uh, power comes great responsibility. And I think you need to have the empathy in you, which it's maybe often not exercised in academic environments I think this is not not to say that we are all inherently less empathic but I think a lot of work can be done in the in that space probably in all workplaces to be honest but um but to to really cultivate empathy where you're looking around yourself and you're seeing okay who is not being included in the conversation who whose perspectives am I, I'm not including. I do a lot of that work in my ADI work. So mm -hmm. I I am very visible, not super diverse, right? I'm a white woman, middle class, cisgender, heterosexual. So, you know, I'm quite close to, to, to being, I, I mean, actually white women tend to be the women that the, the group that are less um, criminalized by police. So I have like extreme privilege in, in some senses, and then I have a lot of privilege, not extreme in others. Um, and I don't embody in myself all the lived experiences to really understand what it looks like, what life looks like for someone that doesn't have the whole, the same level of, of privilege that I, I hold. And I think if I'm capable of doing that, everyone should also be capable to just have the conversations and just reach out to people that don't look like you and try to understand what the challenges are from their perspective. Mm. Um, I try to to amplify those those voices through you know the data capture exercises that I that I do and through um, a lot of 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 the the advocacy work that I do. But um, my powers and and EDI powers in institutions are still very soft powers. They're important because now more and more is tied in with um, reputation, right? Institutional reputation. Um, so then we can leverage a little bit more power in that space, but you still need to really have real senior leadership buy-in. I've been fortunate in the spaces where I've worked that I experienced that level of support that mm -hmm. people generally put their money where their mouth is. <laughs> Um, but I think, again, there is individual responsibility, but there is definitely institutional responsibility yeah. to drive change, that this needs to be independent on who is, you know, at the leadership position. It should be woven into the strategic goals. It should be part of the business goals even to, you know, um, there was a conglomerate of, of tech industries in the U.S. that they came together to think how to tackle the problem of diversity in that space. And they came up with, uh, I think it was in 2021, the ACT report, ACT, ACT report. And where some of the things that they were suggesting is that diverse, metrics of diversity should be also some of the metrics towards which uh, you as a manager are evaluated in your outcomes. So it's not just, you know, how much money or how much business you bring into the company, but at, on top of that, how are you really supporting and advancing the progress of, you know, of, of the, the, the company's strategic goals. And I think ultimately with that type of an, uh, accountability embedded, we will 
hopefully get closer. But mm -hmm. I agree with you, it's a never ending process. Yeah, but it's good to have people like you who are sensitive to the issue, in part based on personal experience and part based on experiences and observations made, or mm -hmm. yeah, the letter, um, who now have the opportunity to shape the narrative and to set guidelines and best practices and recommendations and how for all of us to, to learn from each other across mm -hmm institutions departments on a national level and internationally yeah and and again the fact that my institution but not just my institution but institution our higher education institutions in the uk are employing someone like me mm. it's a massive game that you didn't have a couple of years ago so that in itself it's already a massive gain so mm -hmm. there's incremental gains to be seen Change is not happening fast enough, certainly for people that are in, in marginalized groups. They don't experience that at all. And any experience of, you know, of, of, of victimization, bullying, and harassment are completely unacceptable. Unfortunately, they still exist and they're still disproportionately affecting more certain demographics of the population. But mm. altogether, we are in a journey for the better, I hope. Yeah, I think these negative attitudes are also part of human nature unfortunately but it's on an institution to set set up instruments and measures to protect okay. everyone who's, who's employed exactly. or that organization yeah and i think we are now starting the same narrative around well-being so mm -hmm. this narrative around edi that okay it's maybe hard numbers or demographics are a little bit easier to grasp because we're still at the point where we're just starting we're just trying to get representative levels of representative of, 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 of demographical representation in our in our staff group in our students group right but well-being and, and this is something I'm really passionate about is what are the metrics that universities and, and research institutions should be looking at at the same time I think a really interesting conversation that it's just just start happening is what are the metrics that funding bodies then demand from institutions in order to give funding because I've been exposed to some of the most like highly driven research environments you can think of where um, practices were you know not the best mm. yet the, the, a lot of the times the, a certain type of leader with a certain type of leadership tends to be rewarded again and again and again by our system. And you just see these numbers of PhD students and postdocs that are just chewed up and spit off just for a lab that is consistently publishing, I don't know, cell science, nature, like three of these every year or something like that. But like, what is the human cost of this? Mm -hmm. And I, I think this is something that needs to be looked at. Um, the Wellcome Trust did, uh, I think it was also around 2020 or 2021. They, 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 again, this is one of the biggest funding bodies here in the UK. They did, uh, they have a big commitment towards, you know, research culture as well. And there was one of the people that they've awarded in the past that was accused of bullying and harassment. And I think it was proved that the person was perpetrating bullying and harassment and they withdraw funding. So that was a step in the right direction. Mm -hmm. I could not help but notice that the person to whom this happened happened to be a woman from a minoritized background, meaning maybe their own institution was not so resistant in really, you know, like investigating and 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 finally concluding that they were doing poor practices because. There's a lot of people that have been doing poor practice for many years that go completely untouched. Yeah, we also had a few cases in Germany where female directors or one particular, whichever Max Planck Institute was was taken down from a position because of uh, power misuse of some sort. Mm -hmm. But you haven't heard of any case where a man was accused or, or lost his position because of it. Or not Good maybe <laughs> the, the the thing is i think and it's something often overlooked if you don't work in this sector which is if you have poor relationship with your supervisor 
but you still want to remain in academia, your supervisor is going to be, especially if it's your PhD supervisor or your postdoc supervisor, they're going to be your reference for years to come, right? Mm -hmm. Or often, if you stay in the same sector, um, they were going to be one of the people in the grand panel of uh, uh, in the grand panel evaluation. So how do you run away from this? And there's a really good movie that it's called Picture a Scientist that it's about the experience of three women, um, uh, all American researchers. One of them, the story really resonated with me because they only felt they they suffered from 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 abuse when they were uh, they were doing their internship. And it was a very like super well-renowned uh, scientist, her supervisor. And she only felt empowered enough to, to bring a case against him once she got tenure. Because mm. until then, she didn't feel like she was in a position to mm. do it without damaging her own career. So, you know, it, it's an environment that is ripe for these types of behaviors to happen because you have on the one hand, the message that normalizes abuse and, and, and even students getting into it, like I myself. I mean, I heard so many things that were so inappropriate from supervisors, but I totally normalized it thinking like, yeah, they may be right. It's just I need, I'm not smart enough or I'm not doing this. I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, but you have students that are, you know, very susceptible and very, you know, dependent on the approval and support from their supervisors to then progress their careers. And then you have these people that have unmeasurable power in in depth in different ways because they again they are your reference. Uh, they will evaluate your papers. They will evaluate your grants. I mean, how do you escape from this? Yeah, I, I, I would like to say that there's a too much of a weight on the assumption that that's really the case that you depend so much on just one person but it might mm. actually be a reality for many unfortunately but and like when i had a phd advisory committee or basically we as phd students some of us set mm. up our own so mm. that's maybe also the best practice that phd students ever can embrace to seek um uh support and advice from more just one PI, um, which is not often feasible, but you can always have like another group leader or postdoc, like some yeah. other trusted superior. So we have we have that in the UK. I also had that as a PhD student, but as a PhD student, my PhD support panel was my supervisor and his friends, oh. literally friends. <laughs> so yes, I could not really express, I didn't have the space to really express some of the concerns. And also at the time, again, I just thought that, you know, I was being overtly sensitive about some things or. Yeah, but again, you know, the, the institution that needs to put in place to protect the. Yeah, he was the director of my institution. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's a generational shift in the case. <laughs> it's a, an entirely different conversation, maybe for another day. Uh, but yeah, but okay, I feel like we have touched on a lot of topics: um, mental health, diversity, inclusion, equity, um, the the long path to justice in in a in an academic system that we all also like so much and are part of and have the opportunity to share. Mm -hmm. um, thank you so much, Anna. And as I often um, basically always say, like, welcome back anytime soon. Yes. Um, when we are, well, there's, there's a lot more to talk about this and related topics. And yeah, thanks for, for being with us today. Thanks for sharing your your wisdom, your expertise, your um, your ex experiences as well, and all the best for your current and future career. Thank you so much for this opportunity, Joe, and yeah, happy to be here any other time. Thank you. And also, like some of you might have heard, there was one bark during the recording. Um, some of you <laughs> might know that I have dogs in the house. Sorry about that. And then also some funny yawning sounds. Sorry about that, but also not sorry. Part of, <laughs> part of the process <laughs> thank you thank so you so much